not only had users leaving, you had users leaving, dollars leaving, and founders leaving. The consistent message was Solana is a ghost chain. This was an FTX SBF scam. Now that he's down, this is going to die. That's when everything changed. Darrow Vaughn, the co-founder of Tangent and one of the most brilliant crypto traders in Asia Pacific. Tangent has also been investing in some of the largest projects and protocols in the Web3 universe. You were a previous TradFi guy, like many other people in crypto. How natural was the transition for you into crypto? Oh, it was pretty challenging. Um, so I worked as an investment banker in JP Morgan and I was depressed. The question I was asking myself was, how do I compound my net worth at a rate that can become exponential? And then I discovered crypto shortly after the March 2020 crash. What's your honest take on meme coins? If you're thinking about how does crypto become a $30 trillion asset class, you're going to have to have things to do. There's no lie here telling you this is the future. This is a valueless token backed by memes and vibes. And then you play. You can have great moral but you need to understand that most of this is a zero-sum game. Every time you make money, someone is losing at the other side. I would say that there are three points, basically. Don't cheat, don't lie, and don't hurt someone specifically. If you can go through your crypto career by upholding these three things, you would be considerably better than most people. What's the main lesson you learned at Defiance that we will keep with you forever? I think one of the most important lessons that I learned there was... Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to take a short moment to introduce our partner, Mentor, who helps us make this show possible. Mentor was created to hyperscale the Ethereum network with what we call a layer two that helps users like you and me transact much faster and at a fraction of the cost of the Ethereum network. Mentor has over $2 billion in total value locked, has a mega treasury of $3.7 billion in Bitcoin, ETH, and stablecoins, and has the largest echo fund of the industry with more than $200 million to invest into new projects that want to join the Mental ecosystem. And that's not it. Mental recently launched their Mental Reward Station, which enables you to access some of the absolute best pre-sales deals in the industry by locking some MNT tokens. For example, Mental just partnered with Athena Labs, one of the absolutely most hyped project in the industry, to airdrop 2.5 billion INA points to the MNT stakers. The airdrop was worth more than $3.6 million as pre-market value before INA token listing and had huge potential. If you want to get access to the absolute best deal out there, get yourself some MNT tokens and lock them on the Mental Reward Station by following the link down below in the description. It's easy to join and you can unlock your tokens at any time. The team behind Mental are extremely smart people who are personally trusted with some of my money and who I personally know outside of crypto. We actually had Ignatius Ternus and Jordi Alexander on this podcast who both are key figures in the Mental ecosystem. So I invite you to watch these two very candid and in-depth conversations to develop your own opinion. And please, 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 if you enjoy this show, hit the like button, leave a comment in the comment section and subscribe to this channel. The more subscribers, the better the guests. Thank you so much for your help. And now on to today's episode. So yeah, mm -hmm. you're talking about honesty, also crypto is an interesting one, like especially yeah. with what's happening these days. Okay. <laughs> they're not, uh, they're, I find that there are very, very few people that I can really trust in mm -hmm. crypto. Uh, because of how many things I've seen. It's... We can actually talk about it later. Uh, let's do it now. Oh, okay. Let's do it now. Like, f what did you see? Because I think it's very important for people, especially the new joiners, right? The yes. newcomers. Yeah. There's, there's these narratives online, mostly on Twitter, but could be also on on, on YouTube. Uh, are we all going to make it? Or, I mean, it's just more life cycle, but now it's like a meme coin super cycle. And you always have like another thing that yeah. people buy into. Yeah. And then when you're at the intersection between the actual builders and protocols and, for example, the content creation, which basically I am, you, you are not in the purely content creation, but you Correct. understand the game. Yes. It's all about creating FOMO. Right, it and narrative, is. and yes. and a lot of people don't really understand that. So maybe you can share with us a few um, examples of what you've seen that you don't like at all. I and think it's 
So th this is, it's very individual because I think everyone has their own moral code or their moral compass that they abide. And each one, each person's moral code is a bit different from a, a, someone else's. And not necessarily that someone's moral code is wrong or is insufficient, but if I, I see a lot of things that I, it doesn't agree with my moral code, uh, I won't go into too much detail about what I see, but basically um, it's, the problem with crypto is that it's not as easy as being black and white, being, you know, do you do you follow the law or do you not follow the law? Because a lot of things in crypto are in the gray, right? There are a lot of laws, there are a lot of regulations that are not even in place. So you typically have to decide for yourself where is your line and where so, sort of where is the boundary and do you cross that boundary or not? Mm. Um, and this is sort of, to an extent, dabbling on like, you know, what is considered uh, you know, manipulating the markets, for example. If I put out a tweet and the tweet moves the price, is that, am I manipulating the market, right? You can say, yes, I am. Is that legal? Mm. In equities, it's probably not. In crypto, it's fair game, right? You see it happen all the time. So that's just one example of like, um, you know, things that are considered gray in the space. And so because there's so much grayness, um, everybody chooses to go down their different path. And... What I've seen is in crypto, a lot of people tend to stray towards the grayer side of things. If, if there's a spectrum between white and black, mm. people over time, they tend to stray towards the gray, mainly because of greed and FOMO. So for example, they see a lot of people making a lot of money uh, because it's a bull market, but they feel like they aren't making enough. Then they try and resort to sort of tactics or means that they maybe wouldn't have done at the start of the cycle. Uh, to try and get that. And so... Do, do you think there is that many people who make that much money? Or do you think that there's this kind of echo chamber and there's a lot of bragging online that there, there always... people make? Actually, of course, there is some people who make massive amount of money quickly. Yeah. But it's still the exception, not the rule. And I feel like we all overestimate. It's kind of in the human nature to overestimate what other people have or make. It is. Maybe partly because of insecurities, right? Correct. And then make the wrong decisions. Correct. That end up getting you wrecked at the end. Correct. So so what happens is the people who, you know, post the, uh, you know, the, the P&L statements on, on Twitter, for example, uh, what happens is they tend to, uh, a lot of people tend to look at that and fixate on that. Um, and it kind of creates that echo chamber of sorts where like a lot of people are making a lot of money. Uh, I don't think that's the case, but at the same time, I can't really say that, you know, people aren't making money. I think there's quite a bit of wealth being generated, especially in the last three months. Mm. Uh, so I think you, if you just generally poll most people in crypto today, uh, I would say more than 50% are greater than their last cycle's all time high. Right, and I think that's a pretty good proxy to see how much wealth is being created because, you know, last all-time high was probably sort of December 2021, right? And for you to take that drawdown, which was very brutal mm -hmm. uh, in 2022, and then climb it back up, you would have at least, I think, f you know, three to five X from the bottom, mm -hmm. right? So that's wealth that's being created. So I think that's quite a bit of wealth that's being created. But typically human nature is they never really stop. They always want more. And they always see, you know, because the big uh, the big guys with the big screenshots come out, people always say, oh, look, this guy's making so much. And then they try and do uh, things that err on the side of greediness that they typically wouldn't do to tr because they feel for more, right? So that's something I would caution a lot of people uh, from doing. And because like that instinct of like, I need to make more, um, I think it's fine. It's healthy competition. Like you see other people winning, you want to win as well. That's completely fine. But it shouldn't come at the cost of, you know, breaking your process or breaking your system and more importantly, breaking your moral integrity. What's your moral code? So it's, I try to do things without hurting anyone. Mm. I think that's the most important thing. If someone, if I can identify a particular stakeholder that, directly suffers at the hands of what I'm doing, I do my best to avoid that. And it's, it, I can't say that I don't do that at all because by nature of selling tokens on the open market, that indirectly results in someone else buying what I've sold, right? So I, but then again, that's me versus the market. 
uh, not, for example, me versus you, right? I'm not structuring a deal where I know mm. this is the top and I'm getting, I'm convincing you to say, this is a great investment, please buy it from me. And then you buy the top, right? That's sort of, it's similar, but- You're diluting it across a large number of participants. Instead correct. Of like so that a- is sort of my justification yeah. of- <laughs> where the line is yeah but as i said it's very great right so this is this is the part where i think everyone needs to sort of decide where they want to be on the spectrum and there's no right or wrong answer probably a good takeaway from that is obviously having great values some people might say hey in crypto you can't make money if you have great values if you do the right things because there's always someone greedier who's going to kind of screw you over um but taking it, that, uh, as you were saying, is basically you can have great morals or great values, but you need to understand that most of this game is still a zero-sum game. And therefore, yes, every time you make money, someone is losing on the other side. Sooner Correct. or later, it might not be right now, yes, but someone will lose money somewhere. Correct. Especially when there is this mega deleveraging event at the end of each cycle, yes. which there, there is someone who is basically taking this money from you if you haven't done it already, yes, right? I would say that actually, uh, if you could sum it up, there are three points basically. Don't cheat, don't lie, and don't hurt someone specifically. I think that would be, if you can go through your crypto career by upholding these three things, um, I think you would be considerably better than most people Mm. in the space, I'd say. Who are you? Well, okay. Uh, my name is Daryl. Uh, people know me online as Wang Garen. I am the co-founder of Tangent. Uh, Tangent is a prop firm that invests in crypto. Uh, we started out at the start of 2023, uh, and we've been investing across, uh, you know, venture and the liquid markets for the past 18 months. You're a previous uh, TradFi guy, right? Like many other people in crypto. Yep. How natural was the transition for you into crypto? Oh, it was pretty challenging. Um, so I, I can I can walk you through uh, the very brief, brief background as to how I got into crypto. So it was COVID, actually. I was an investment banker in JP Morgan, and I was depressed uh, with the type of work I was doing and the hours I was working, uh, knowing that what I did really didn't really matter to mm. the ultimate end goal of what they were trying to do uh, in investment banking. And I discovered crypto shortly after the March 2020 crash. I think this was Bitcoin was at like 8,000 and ETH was at three, two to $300. Um, and basically the question I was asking myself at that point in my career was, how do I compound my net worth at a rate that can become exponential? And even though investment banking was a very lucrative job in terms of getting a, you know, a comfortable salary, uh, it was a linear progression. It was not exponential. Mm. And so I realized investing was the only way to compound uh, growth uh, of your portfolio. And I was like, all right, uh, what is the highest risk or most volatile asset class uh, in investing? And then I sort of came, I stumbled across crypto. Uh, and it took me about a month or two uh, to understand what Bitcoin was. Mm. just from a complete zero knowledge in 2020, uh, understand what Bitcoin was, uh, and then sort of slowly gravitate towards Ethereum. And uh, nobody around me actually was in crypto at the time. So I really discovered crypto by myself. It wasn't like a friend looped me in. Uh, This was in, you know, when nobody was really talking about crypto as well. So it took me about three months um, of understanding, discovering Bitcoin, understanding, uh, moving from Bitcoin to Ethereum, and then moving from Ethereum to Cardano, which is mm. actually the first coin um, <laughs> I looked at. Yeah. And this was because I was going through it through the retail yeah. rails, right? So after Ethereum, they sell you the Ethereum killer, which is Cardano. So by the third month, I was like, Cardano is the future of the space. Uh, it took me- You're going to do this thing in Africa, right? <laughs> yes. Charles Hoskinson with that whiteboard uh, exactly. video that was iconic. It took me- a. I think two to three months more after that to realize that the crypto space was a lot more complicated than Mm. I had initially assumed. And then I went straight to the scams. Um, So I was deep in the shitcoins for about two months. This is DeFi summer? 
This was DeFi Summer, yes. Okay. But I was sort of looking at DeFi Summer, not really understanding what it was. I ended up becoming exit liquidity for the guys playing DeFi Summer. Of course. Um, but that, you know, that's basically your trial by fire. Every time mm. you join crypto, you have to pay your dues. Mm. Uh, so me getting dumped on by the guys uh, making millions in DeFi Summer was my sort of trial by fire. And I think at, so this was like August 2020, and what I realized I ended up doing was I'd go to work at 9 a.m. I'd come back at about 1, 2 a.m. every day. And then I would look at DeFi, uh, look at shit coins until 4 a.m. And I'd trade them for like two hours after work. I'd sleep for four hours. I'd go back to work. And I'd do this. I was doing that for two months. And I was absolutely exhausted. <laughs> but I realized every day when... I was working, I was actually living for that two hours. I would mm. go home and trade. Yeah. So what I realized after that was I kind of discovered that I found my calling, which is sort of, you know, trading. Trading shit coins. Trading shit coins, rigged. discovering <laughs> the future of finance via crypto. And yeah. just so happened that in, I think, August or September 2020, uh, I found Defiance uh, and they were looking for and let's join them. And so I actually met Arthur. I was one of the guests of your podcast recently for lunch and uh, hit it off with him and started working as an analyst with him in October 2020. And that was it. That was my journey in. That was pretty, but pretty much the, I mean, kind of perfect timing for everything, right? Discover like more crypto right after the COVID crash. I mean, you could have discovered yeah. maybe before, but you probably have lost a lot of money in the crash. Yeah and not really by the bottom, then go very quickly through this process and then understand more than Cardano. Because if you go to Arthur and apply for Defiant and say, no, hey, Cardano you is the you future. Wouldn't, you wouldn't pass his <laughs> test. No, most likely, most definitely not. But uh, basically kind of like the perfect uh, perfect uh, action plan and, and timing and execution, which obviously like you might say, oh, maybe I was a bit lucky, but like this probably is a more or less zero percent of luck to go through all that process so quickly and yeah. then get hired by Defiance, yeah. which probably made a massive difference. It made all the right? difference in the world. Because a lot of people started much earlier than you in crypto and yeah. haven't achieved even 5% of what you have. And sure. probably Defiance was a perfect way to start, right? Yeah. It, it didn't start out by, uh, like that, by the way. Um, I think I remember two weeks into my my role as an analyst, I had put in my entire net worth into shitcoins and I was down 40% because this was after DeFi Summer topped. Mm. And I was down 40% and then it bottomed. And then from then on, we never looked back. So the volatility was, I still remember, it was unpleasant when I started. It's unpleasant, but it's also very addictive. Yes. Because if you understand, you're a TradFi guy, yeah. you understand investing, compounding, you understand that crypto is basically compounding on steroids yes. if you're in the right moment of the cycle Correct. and you don't lose all your crypto yeah. or your coins, which is easier said than done. Yes. Then you compound at a crazy, uh, crazy rate, right? Yes. What's the main lesson you learned at Defiance that, will, that, that you will keep with you forever? I think it's really about sizing. I think mm. um, a great example and something that I think one of the most important lessons that I learned there was knowing that if you believe you're right on something and you really believe in, your portfolio should express that conviction. And I find that most often people fail to match their conviction with their bet sizing. And a great example was this was uh, the sushi trade that we did in December 2020. Mm. Uh, I, I, I think... I pitched Arthur Sushi at the bottom of the DeFi bear market saying that this, you know, could have a recovery arc. Um, and at the time, Sushi was 70 cents. Mm. And uh, we ended up putting on a pretty big position on the fund. And I put on a position on my PA as well. Uh, and the position was, I think, 5%, 7, 7 of my portfolio at the time. And it was my highest conviction bet. Mm. And Sushi quickly doubled to 150 and I looked at Arthur and said, you know, this is a great trade. Shall we take it off? And Arthur looked at me and said, do you think the thesis has played over? And I was like, no, I don't think so. I'm not sure. I'm not sure where this goes. Uh, and he said, he, he basically lent me his conviction. And he was very bullish. He said that this, I think, can go much bigger than what you expect. And so learning through both having my own conviction in 
the thesis plus also understanding someone much more experienced than me echo that sentiment uh, allowed me to basically push the sizing on sushi from eight it started at eight percent and went to like 15 percent i pushed it to 50 percent mm. on the double and that was something that I would never have done in equities. That was unheard of. When something two exists, you bet three times more on that. And basically, I wrote that at one fifty all the way to about fifteen dollars. Uh, and that was how I made my first million uh, mm. in crypto. And it was a very, very quick process because I, I'm not sure whether you remember in January 2021 there was that DeFi season, yeah, and everything just exploded. So bet basically allowing if you feel really strongly on a thesis that you have or a bet that you've made, make sure that your bet size is commensurate with that conviction. That's very interesting. 50%? 50% of my net worth. Yes. Uh, what's your recommendation? So you're basically, uh, the, the thing that you excel at is liquid, liquid trading, right? Yes. How do you structure a liquid uh, crypto portfolio? that still manages risk, yes, but that can at the same time move the needle in your investing and overall life goals, which is exactly what you've done, right? Yes. What's the max bet you go for? And maybe how many bets at the same time, right? Because there's also a question of concentration versus yes. diversification, right? So I'm never a fan of diversification. Um, I think diversification is always the killer of our performance. Mm. Uh, in Tangent right now, we have this list of basically the top five largest positions that we have at any one time. And we do our best to not make that percentage drop below 75%. Meaning the five largest positions of the fund has to express 75% of our bet sizes. Mm. Because if you are too evenly spread out amongst like 20 or 30 different positions, you can't keep track of them all. Right. Absolutely. But here you're still basically saying that your uh, your sushi bet yes. would be 15% because you're saying the top five yes. are 75%. Yes. So basically it would be 15, not 50. Yes. I mean, obviously you might have much more money now. Maybe that's one of the reasons. Yes. So you kind of diversify in your concentration, let's say it that way. But like, so for me, it's really, the key question is really that is, Hey, I of of course it also depends on where you think you are at in the cycle. Yes. In the beginning, you go maybe more all in, etc. But the, the 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 goal today is really we'll talk about a lot of things, but to debunk the kind of myth that a new person in crypto might have, and we all go through the wrong wrong way of thinking. For example, I have high conviction. I don't allocate enough. Yes. Right. So. So to, to, to answer your, your initial question um, on why uh, I don't have, why at the time I could size 50% of my net worth in sushi, most of the time now it's because of liquidity constraints. Mm. Even though I have a very high conviction, but I can't put half my fund. Okay, because it's too it. big, okay. Compared to the, the correct, of correct. care. Of it, correct. But you would do it? If I was if small, no question. I'd swing for the, I'd swing for the fences. Uh, obviously, you have to balance it. I mean, I'm not going to put 50% into this new meme coin that launched six hours ago that could be a honeypot, <laughs> right? But um, yeah, I, I'd say that when, if you are small, and I, I'd consider small as someone managing, you know, you know twenty to $100,000 uh, in, you know, in your portfolio in crypto, at that size, that's the perfect size. Because you can really, if you find something you really like, you can slam one third of your portfolio into it. You can slam 50%. I, I tend to now not advise people to go more than 50%. Actually, none of this is financial advice, but like, um, <laughs> never. I, I, I don't think above 50% is that great because if you're wrong and for example, you, you get exploited, right? Or the team rocks for whatever reason and you are basically just wrong in your thesis. Uh, losing 50% is really really painful uh, and you, if you go further than that it gets even worse mm. right if you put in 80 percent, you lose that all that means you have to 5x to get to where you originally were so i would say 50 percent is like the hard cap for me uh, i wouldn't really go higher than that for any one thing we have tried uh more recently um 
to do a couple of sort of ecosystem bets. So for example, uh, if let's say I'm, okay, a, a great example is uh, base ecosystem right now is mm -hmm. really hot, right? Uh, I think DGEN is you know pulling multiples uh, and a lot of the coins on base are getting looked at. If I was, uh, you know, a lot smaller and I had no liquidity constraint, I'd be open to doing something like putting 50% of my portfolio into a variety of base ecosystem bets. But they all express the same view, meaning I am bullish base, mm -hmm. right? This is just an example of how I would structure something uh, where I could sort of reach that conviction level of getting to that 50% mark, but not like putting everything into one meme coin that may wrong, right? You can maybe put it into like three or four different base meme coins and still get that sort of proxy exposure. So we talked about position sizing. What's your biggest position today? I mean, I know you already said it on another podcast, which is why I ask. Yeah. And I have a bunch of questions around that, yeah. which is also why I ask. Yeah. Uh, so today, my biggest position is Bitcoin. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. This changed. <laughs> um, so, but I retained the same thesis uh, that I had for Solana. Uh, I just felt that Solana had, uh, at the time when I pitched Solana in the previous podcast, I think, I believe it was like 140. Mm. Uh, we had about a third of the fund in Solana. Uh, and then we brought it up to about 200. Uh, we cut it slightly under 200. Uh, but I think right now where we are at, I feel like Bitcoin needs to lead in order for the rally to continue. Uh, Bitcoin has sort of stayed at 70K, you know, flirted with all-time highs for quite a bit. I think if it doesn't move, uh, the alt outperformance that you've been getting is going to quickly fizzle out. Um, so if this rally is to continue, I think the healthiest way for it to continue doing so is through Bitcoin. And so as an optimist, I, I, I do hope and I believe that this rally will continue. And so uh, I denominate in, in Bitcoin now. So I think through the cycle, uh, and these views probably won't change for this entire cycle, uh, BTC and Sol are the two beta bets that I will rotate between. And BTC, I, I choose BDC when mm. I'm a bit more conservative, uh, but I understand that BDC is going to be that player PVE coin uh, for the considerable future for the simple fact that you're going to have consistent ETF flows, maybe mm. not on a daily basis, but over a long enough trend, you're going to have very comfortable flows buying BDC to help push you up. Solana, for me to denominate in Solana, I have to express a very strong view that alts are going to offer for BDC. Mm. And so that's really the distinction. Which would happen only once BTC had a good run, so which it hasn't had right now. So you're thinking, how do I protect my downside? Correct. Right. While and still like obtaining exposure. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So it's a pendulum, right? You, yeah. you 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 swing between BDC and alts, and uh, because ideally you don't really want to have. Okay, this is I'm going to get a flag for this, but like you don't really want to have too much cash in a bull market because the biggest uh, drag on a performance is when you sell things too early. And then you're sidelined as the market just keeps going up and then you don't have a good idea of when to buy back in. So Absolutely. you want to keep beta, but not maybe not the most aggressive type of beta. So BTC it is. So BTC is almost your cash-ish? For now. Exactly. For now. Exactly. So a couple of questions regarding what we just talked about. Yeah. Because these are like the key points i think i didn't expect to arrive that, to that quickly but like they're the key points i think that people need to uh, take away from this conversation the first one is so solana if i remember well right you kind of fumbled or kind of like missed the first pump is it correct for i mean from the, from so, one of the podcasts I, yeah. I i saw was like oh yeah solana was not bullish enough Basically. Yes. Okay. Yes. I right? remember this. Yes. Correct. And so obviously it's not to criticize. It's more because it's something that happens very often in yes. crypto, right? Way too often. So Solana, now you say it's one of the big, probably big position to have this cycle. Yeah. So you change your mind, right? From the beginning of the cycle 
until a few months back. And there is this meme on Twitter that goes uh, something like, the most dangerous words in crypto are already pumped. Yes, correct. So the already pumped mindset is what will often make people miss out on the best trades yes. in, a, in a cycle, right? Correct. Talk me through the entire process that happens in your mind when you go from, damn, I missed the beginning of this pump, mm. and now it's kind of pumped already, to actually this is very positive because it's probably just the start of, of an overall much greater pump, and so I will bet big on this. So, And that's what a lot of people who are new to people don't do, right? Yes. Which is why I'm asking, and I'm Correct. picking the Solana example because it kind of happened, Correct. right? So I'll walk you through what we, how we looked at Solana really from the depths of the bear market. Um, we were looking at Solana at $9, which mm. was the ultimate bottom. And the mistake that we made was we thought that fundamentals would lead price in the depths of the bear market. And so what we did, because we, we, we were perfectly aware that Solana had dropped something like 95%, more than that, actually. Um, I think 97, yeah. Yeah, 97% from the highs, right? So we were definitely aware of, like, oh, you know, this was a really exciting coin of the last cycle. Maybe it could have a resurgence. The risk reward is great, right? And so we looked at it from that lens. Can we buy, Can we build a case to long Solana here at like $10, $15? And what, we did, what, what did we do? We looked at all the metrics. We went to speak to multiple founders on Solana pick up the phone and say, hey, how's the ecosystem doing? How are the users? Is TVL still leaving the ecosystem? And every single call was negative. So from our due diligence, the consistent message was Solana is a ghost chain. This was an FTX SBF scam. Now that he's down, this is going to die. And all the founders were actually reaching out to us as well saying, could you provide me introductions to BD contacts from another ecosystem, mm. thinking that they, they're going to bridge. So you not only had users leaving, you had users leaving, dollars leaving, and founders leaving, yeah. right? And so from that point of view, we basically wrote off Solana and said, okay, maybe this ecosystem is not investable. And the big problem or the big mistake was- well, Basically too early. You were too no, early it, it's in because, analyzing all that stuff. Correct. It's because- Fundamentals doesn't lead price in crypto. Price leads fundamentals. That was the mistake. And so when uh, we realized that we probably made a mistake after Solana went from, I think at $25, we still had that view. Once Solana broke 25, we started seeing the sentiment turn a bit. All the founders who initially were like one foot out the door going to leave, retracted their foot and said, we're going to double down on Solana. And this was like 5x from the lows, right? Mm. And then you begin to see the sentiment turn. And so that's when we started realizing, actually, maybe we did something wrong here. And so we started building, we started trading. I wouldn't say we built like a long-term position, but we started trading Solana at like 40, mm. 40 something dollars. Uh, and then we did reasonably well. I think we caught a decent amount of the 40 to $60 move. And then at $60, we re-underwrote it. And we basically said, Solana has very clearly not died. Solana still remains the best alternative to Ethereum today. It is the best user experience. It is the fastest and cheapest chain. And against all odds, it has survived SBF's drag on the ecosystem, mm. right? So all that toxicity of like the very high FTV float scams like of the last cycle that had endless VC selling pressure. You know, there's so many of those. And I'm not sure whether you remember Solana. It survived all of that. Yeah. And so at $60, $65, we basically started building a long-term position again. And that was when we formed the view that Solana could be the retail coin of the market. And we continued to size up that position at $65 all the way to about $120. So from looking at Solana at $9, saying this is a dead chain, changing our mind at $40, and then putting on a longer-term bet at $60, all the way up to 120. That, I think, is where a lot of people face difficulty. And if you get it wrong, you end up looking like an absolute idiot. Absolutely. Right? So, so that's what it is. And until today, right, even Solana at $200, I still think that that thesis hasn't changed. Mm. Uh, it's just more so of a question of 
um, I'm trying to sort of time the intracycle rotations between alts and BDC a bit more. So, but it's very clear to me, it's only BDC and ETH. Sorry, BDC and Solana. Yeah. As sort of places where I want to denominate in. So you basically doubled down from 60 to 120, right? Yeah. That's very interesting. Yeah. Do you double down on a winner like you've done, right? Yes. Or do you go look for a smaller cap coin that follows the same narrative but hasn't pumped yet? And let's take two cases here. Okay. The first one is you missed the winner. Let's say you missed Solana. Yeah. Do you buy Solana and then double down? And then the second case, you hold the winner. You're already hold, uh, holding yeah. it. Do you buy, do you double down or you say, ah, oh, this other cash portion I have here, I'll find AVAX, right? Hmm. Or maybe if you look at meme coins, hmm. hey, I mean, for example, WIF is a good example, right? Oh, yes. WIF is a very good example. Certain market cap, but you're like, okay, do I go into like, let's not talk about the 5 million or 10 million market cap meme coins yes. because this is like a complete casino. Yeah. But do I go to the ones that have some traction on base, right? Two, mm. three, four, 500 mil. Mm. Or do I double down on WIF, which has 4 billion market cap, but seems to be one of the big trades of this cycle, right? Yeah. So I think... I'm definitely guilty of trying to find mm. the next thing. It's it's only human. Do I you think, think it's ego based? Do no, you think it's it's not ego based? I think it's just it's human psychology of like rejecting the pump. You see something <laughs> too much. Rejecting you know there was that the that, there was that uh, Ivan on tech. He was like, you must embrace the pump into yeah, your yeah, life. Yeah, absolutely. So I think it was re related to sell token actually. Oh, okay. I, did, I, I, I just remember that meme. But or, or maybe, you, yeah, you, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a great one. <laughs> it's a great one. So, so I think he's like naturally, if you see something go up way too much, what you do is you naturally reject it. You say, this has gone up too much. What am I going to do? I'm going to find the next one. Right? So that's just normal human uh, behavior. But what I've typically realized in certain market regimes, Bull, like let's say a full bull market regime, doubling down on the first mover always, almost always outperforms. Even if it's much larger in market cap? This is where it depends a little bit. Oh, uh, on a risk-adjusted basis? I think so. It will, absolutely. Yes, right? yes. And that's what you're looking for if you're a smart investor is risk-adjusted return, Correct. not... But I, I would caveat it by saying that this only works in specific market conditions. If you are in a sort of choppy market condition, do that and you get killed. So a great example is if you try to long every every Pepe breakout in 2023, you would have died. You're talking about leverage trading here? Uh, or are you no, talking just, about just no, buying a leverage. spot just, back just, and waiting? Yeah, just buying, right? Uh, but let's say if you try to put on a long Pepe trade with an invalidation below 20%, for example, mm. as a normal trade, you would have lost money like 10 times out of 10 if you tried to long every breakout, right, in 2023. But the one time in 2024 where it's a sig it signals a different paradigm change, that one time you do it, the returns you get from that one move outweighs all the losses that you made from the last 10 and because it's a different paradigm. So... I think it's very important to know what kind of market you're in as well. Um, and I usually use specific events that I typically would not expect to happen um, as signs to me that tells me that the market is sort of changing. For example? Um, so the first one was very clear to me. The first one was in October 2023, Solana breaking $40. Mm. I think at that time, Solana had like done like a 50% move. And that time, it wasn't like full bull market yet. You know, Bitcoin was flirting with 30K, you know, breaking a little bit. Um, so Solana breaking $40 and going straight to 70. That to me showed me that this market, risk on, proper risk on sentiment is returning to the market because in every other situation, Solana should have topped that $40. So that was a huge sign to me. 
Uh, that was in October 2023. Once I saw that, I basically put the whole book wrong, all altcoins. Okay. Because to me, once that's possible in Solana, then it's game on, right? But until I see something like that, I'm a bit more conservative. I When I don't really know what the market's going to do, I'm not going to bet so large on things, right? Uh, the second one to me that really showed me that the pendulum has swung to really full bull market mode was Pepe breaking out of that one year range that it had. Mm. And that one hit really hard because I was shorting Pepe. I saw the range, uh, it was at range high. I remember it's, I don't know what it is, but it's basically two, right? Uh, it was it was 1.7, I started shorting it, it went to two. Now for, for, for reference, now it's like eight, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like uh, eight, I was eight, shorting yeah. two. Uh, because Pepe just moved 30% on a day when everything else hadn't really moved. And I thought, this this is insane, right? This is like meme coins moving this much. This should be the end of the, uh, end of the cycle. And so I put on a short. 24 hours later, I got stopped out. Uh, I lost 40% on that trade. And over the next week, Pepe went from 2 to 10. Mm. And when you see that kind of thing happening you know once again you've moved this is no longer the same market right and then you start adjusting so once i start i started seeing pepe do that we started looking at different other coins started looking at whiff all of a sudden what's the ceiling for whiff is it a billion dollars is it three billion dollars is it ten billion dollars because the last cycle doge's ceiling was 95 billion so then you start having these conversations again you see uh, and this is what I think a lot of people are going through right now with meme coins especially. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, as you probably know, we are teaming up with Astar Network on this show. Astar Network is a decentralized blockchain platform that aims to bring billions of people into Web3. And the Astar team has a very specific strategy to make this happen, to partner with the biggest conglomerates in Web2 and help them onboard their customers into our world, the Web3 world. If you want to check out for yourself, I invite you to watch the candid podcast I recorded with Sota Watanabe, the founder of Startail Labs and Astar Network. And please, 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 if you enjoy this show, hit the like button, leave a comment in the comment section and subscribe to this channel. The more subscribers, the better the guests. Thank you so much for your help. And now on to today's episode. I don't know, there's too many ways we can take this, this, this discussion. Where, Where do you want to go? We're talking about meme coins, so like, let's talk about the meme coins one. All right. What's your honest take on meme coins? They present or they reflect the financial nihilism that has mm. been, that the market has felt over the last 18 months, I think. I think the last very meaningful technology that was introduced to crypto was DeFi. So sort of in a way that you could do something net new that you hadn't been able to done before. I think gaming, you had a nice experiment with Axie that sort of unlocked what could be, but not really in a sustainable way yet. And so ever since then, people have been waiting for what's next. And we have been on the venture side, we've been trying to find things that can express what is next, but nothing has really come to market yet. I think you had very small snippets of friend tech, which introduced social fire to an extent, how to trade social tokens, but that never really took off. And so what has happened now, this, it's manifested in a sense where people want to be risk on, but people know that there's nothing really interesting or paradigm breaking in crypto this cycle. Mm. And so what do they do then? They go straight into stuff where there's absolute brutal honesty. There's no lie here telling you this is the future of finance, the future of gaming, the future of anything. This is a valueless token backed by memes and vibes, and then you play. Mm. So it's, I would say that it's, it's a net positive in the space because it gets people thinking about speculation in crypto again. But I think if we don't see any net new experiences in crypto soon. The addressable market 
of crypto is likely going to be a lot smaller than we think it is. Meaning it's o- it's only going to be catering towards a decentralized casino, right? And that's I think it's been echoed quite a bit. Which it's been already. for many years since it the has. beginning. It's pretty correct. much that. So if it, you think about that, correct. It, brutally honest, and I got like really. This is a guy on Twitter who basically called me an idiot because I was just saying, obviously I understand decentralized exchanges, atomic swaps, all that stuff. But why why has all this stuff been built for people to trade and gamble? Yes. Up until now. Yes. So the only real applications are, I mean, I would say Bitcoin. Bitcoin, st- stable coin. Yes. Stable coin, I would even put it as okay, cross-border uh, remittances, but also uh wealth preservation for third world countries that yes. need access to the dollar. Yes. Fine. And then it's exchanges. Casino house, yes. basically. Yes. So for it's the a moment, lot that's smaller. It. It's a lot smaller. So if you if you're thinking about the dream of crypto, right? How does crypto become a 20, 30 trillion dollar asset class? You're gonna have to have things to do where you are unable to do this anywhere else. Yeah. Right? Or not. Crypto's not not going to become a twenty trillion dollar asset class. Maybe it'll stay at five trillion, maybe even at the height it goes to 10 trillion, but it's never really going to rival an entire asset class like real estate, like equities, like bonds, Yeah. right? You're going to need something new. And so it's all fun. It's all fair game <laughs> right now trading the whiff. I hope it goes to $10, but it's a shorter term game. Um, I think it's just really just attention. It's not, it's not why I'm in the space for. It's not building the future. It's not building the finance future. Finance and yes. the decentralized internet. Yes. I mean, Alex Vanelli was on this podcast twice, actually. The second time he said all this speculation and, you know, meme coins or even NFT investments are kind of first funding innovation, right? Yes. And second, you know, if you can, he was saying, if you can collateralize a pudgy penguin in the future, you'll be able to collateralize something else. It, on the blockchain, which is much more meaningful. Right? Yes. I'm not saying Pudgy Penguin are not meaningful, but I'm saying, yeah. right, so in all this speculation and kind of mania, there is some good. The problem is it's very noisy and it takes a lot of, um, it's very dist- um, dis- destructive, do we say? Basically, it all the attention that should be put on building real stuff right now, it's kind of gone because everybody's just chasing this money, right, or this latest chain coin and even i would say from what i've seen even in the builders i mean you're closer to the builders than me but from what i see is a lot of people who had the right values to build the right things they realize that they're not in the right narrative so then they're like fuck man how do i capitalize on that yes i'll change my thing i'll think sh- more short term because i can't even raise money for something that makes sense but some people send 30 million of soul to random dude online right yes correct <laughs> so i i think this is where the f- crypto founders really have it difficult because you could be building something net new, something actually con- you know, creating value for a certain stakeholder, right? But if it doesn't fit with the flavor of the month in crypto, you're just not going to get any attention. And mm. I think building a business or a service and catering towards the attention span of the crowd in crypto are two completely different skill sets. And the most successful crypto founders today are able to do both really well, Mm. right? But I think there are very, very few of them today. Um, I think actually one example of someone that I think has done a phenomenal job is uh, Guy from Athena. He's going to come on the podcast in... Two or three weeks, actually. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, so he is one of the uh, one of the f- early uh, angel investments that Hanjun made. Mm. Uh, it's actually the only uh, investment that we doubled down on. So we did the seed and then the the follow on uh, because we really loved Guy's execution. Uh, he brings to the table the first sort of innovation in DeFi we've seen really since the last cycle, which is through uh, USDE and. He knows exactly what the crypto crowd wants. Regarding the meme coins and this entire idea about fundamentals in crypto, right? So my approach in the beginning of this cycle, like about a year ago, Mm -hmm. right, was I'll build my portfolio 
and I'll have what's the next ETH? What's the ETH of last cycle? Of this cycle, sorry. So what's the chain that got really wrecked and that might have some crazy activity like we had with DeFi summer and then NFT? And uh but you don't know in advance, right? Mm. So you, you know, it could be Chainlink or Solana or whatever. I mean, I ended up doing some bets that, I mean, actually I was very heavy in Solana, but the, the key question was, so this I kind of got right, like sizing also, mm. good. Mm. But then you have some beta plays, right? Mm. So basically you're saying, oh, if I think this thing goes Obviously, I had some ETH too. Mm. I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to have some SOL, some ETH, and I want to have some SOL beta plays or ETH beta plays. And I went to look into the, the projects with great fundamentals. Ah, my favorite. On the ETH yes. um, ecosystem, right? Yes. So I was like, Lido mm. is amazing. Oh, perfect. Lido, perfect example. We also talked about Lido with Alex Van Evik here. Yeah. He was saying these give fundamentals are seem to be bearish in crypto. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, if ETH goes up, let's say 3x, Lido probably goes up, I don't know, 15x because it's much smaller. Yes. But it's also a safe bet because it has amazing fundamentals. They made great money. They they basically they all own the majority of the liquid taking uh, of ETH. And then what I realized is not only the fundamentals don't matter, but coming back to our beloved meme coins, it seems that the key meme coins on each chain now is kind of like the, the best beta play for yes. the ecosystem. Yes. I think, so, I think first you have to understand what beta actually means. Beta means a levered bet mm. on another coin. And Historically, you've seen, for example, in during DeFi summer, if ETH were to run, the DeFi tokens would run even harder, right? Not this time, not this time. And I think the key lesson here is that beta changes. Uh, coins correlations with the underlying asset changes all the time. And so you can't just think because... Lido is so closely associated with Ethereum that it's going to be good beta. In fact, I think if you plot the Lido ETH chart over the last 18 months, it's probably just down only. Yeah. Um, so it's a complete mid curve take, basically exactly. saying, hey, Lido has so many ETH, it's the best beta. Exactly. Play on but ETH. it's a fantastic protocol. So many things are being built on it, mm. right? Um, maybe one day <laughs> it will get the re rating it deserves. I've long ago learned to ab abandon my value investing principles in crypto of, you know, trying to find undervalued tokens like Lido, take a position, wait for the market to realize it. I could basically wait the whole cycle before that happens, if it even happens. Um, so, so what I think this is why momentum in crypto is so important, because if the beta changes every other week on the underlying asset, what do you hold? That's why people rotate so quickly and so often in crypto, because everyone's trying to find the right beta. Uh, it's, a, it's a game I wouldn't really advise a lot of people to play, because I think if you don't really know what you're doing, chances point. are that you lose money. That's a good point. Uh, if you're chasing the narrative, you're probably too yeah. late, and you're going to lose all your money, and you better buy and hold, especially if you're a normal person, right? Yeah, if, I would say that if you're not spending 30 hours a week looking at crypto, you shouldn't be chasing these things because you probably end up being EL to the people who are spending 90 hours a week looking at these things. That's my honest advice. I think if you just buy and hold, let's say you're bullish Solana, right? If you just buy and hold Solana. That's all. Exactly. That's it. But exactly. You, you have two decisions. When you buy, okay, sorry, three decisions. When you buy, how much you buy and when you sell. That's it. Mm. Right. You're not looking to, okay, I'm going to trade soul for BDC. I'm going to trade maybe soul for Gito or maybe Whiff, and then I'm going to rotate back into soul. These are the things you do when you're really full time into this, really trying to optimize and squeeze as much as you can out of the market. But if you're not, if you don't have the time to spend doing this, watching the flows, watching the attention, then you're just going to get eaten alive by the people who are. So 
It's a cautionary tale. This is very close to, I mean, I have three examples on my mind that are all very different in what they do. Obviously, Michael Saylor. Yes. Just buying Bitcoin. But yes. he's going to massively outperform because he has like a forever kind of time frame yes. view. Obviously, he has massive amount of money, but just buying Bitcoin itself for a lot of people, if you look at maybe two full cycle, probably you'll do better just buying Bitcoin. Oh, yeah. Because you will make so much money, but you will lose so much that in terms of Bitcoin, you probably have less Bitcoin uh, after two or, or three cycles. And if you just had bought and held the Bitcoin, right? Yes. And then if you want to go a bit more down the risk curve, you have, it's what I'm doing myself, right? With the big portion of my portfolio is last year, last cycle was ETH and then Solana and then Luna, which yes. massively got, got me wrecked. Um, and then this cycle, kind of Solana, but you have, uh, I mean, Raul Powell is talking about that. Don't fuck it up. Like basically mm. just, you need to be early in the trend mm. by maybe not the biggest one, but the second or third one, the thing that the one that you have most conviction and then just do nothing. And then you have one of the big bulls of uh, Sol, Chris uh, Bernsky. Yes. Who basically is saying that, what you're saying. Yes. Three decision, right? Yeah. When do you buy? How much like you how, buy. How, exactly. And, and then when you sell. sell. Yes. Done. Yes. And again, a lot of new people do come and say, oh, no, but hey, look, I can have all these airdrops if I do all this stuff. Or I can get all these points. Or I can do all that stuff. But like what they don't understand is like the ICOs in 2018 or the DeFi summary 2020 or the NFTs in 2021. Now all these meme coins, I mean, the majority of the meme coins, all these points, all these airdrop is just protocols or founders trying to find narratives to get your liquidity mm. and to get your ETH or get your soul now. Yes. And so if you don't do any of this shit, you're probably going to end up with much more soul than if you do all this shit. Probably. So I, I, I will say if that. If you're a normal person. Correct. If you're willing to spend the time and the effort to really learn these things, roll up your sleeves and go deep into the trenches, then by all means, go for all these things because this is where you make $1,000 become $100,000. I mean, there's so many successful airdrop stories. But to be able to know of the airdrops in the first place, strand, strategize and plan how you want to maximize your airdrop. A person spending 10 hours a week on crypto is not going to know how to do that, right? It, it, you, you just the, That person is going to look on Twitter one day and say, oh, look, that guy made $100,000 on an airdrop. Wow, what is this? And then slowly... That's how he sort of discovers the airdrop sort of meta, mm. right? But by that time, the game is quite figured out already. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. The guy who made the 100,000 he, airdrops, he that, knew... That guy has been in the depths of the bear market he grinding. He knew exactly what he was doing. Exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's no... There's, there's no, no free lunch. crypto and there's no free lunch. There's no and free lunch. And if you're lucky once, you're probably going to lose it all. Correct. Because you think you're a legend, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I, actually, something interesting uh, in in my part with Heike, we're actually going through, uh, you know, how second cyclists think. And something that I think people still don't recognize or appreciate is how much or how well you protect yourself on the downturn. And mm -hmm. nobody, I don't think anybody's really thinking about this, this cycle. Um, but if you are able to draw down only 50% from the top, after the bear market versus someone who draws down 90% from the top, you would be in an infinitely better state than he is going into the next market. Or even if you want to leave, for example, if let's say you made five times or 10 times your money, mm -hmm. if that draws down by 50%, you still make two and a half to five times your money, right? And that's, that's great. How many people have made a ridiculous amount of money and then lost it all? Yeah. I hear of so many stories. It's actually insane. People make eight figures, 10, 20 million dollars, lose it all back in the bear market, trying to keep longing when the market structure is turned. And then restart again at 500K. I mean, it's still a nice figure, but like for someone that went to 20 million, comes down to 500K. How, how soul crushing is that? It's tough. Yeah, it's, I mean, maybe think in terms of like multiple cycles. That's what I'm trying to tell people. Hey, the first cycle, 
the more you have to play with for the next one, yeah. the better your position. Sure. Yeah, but I want to get to that. If you have this big goal in your life, maybe you can split it in two or three cycles and think in terms of kind of stairs. Okay, I reached the first yeah. step of the stair. It's almost impossible to not get to the second one if I'm able to stop now yes. and wait. Yes. Obviously, much easier said than done. Very difficult. Very difficult. Uh, do you play the meme coin game? And if yes, as, as I said, I was shorting Pepe. So I got really toasted mm. at the first leg. I have now started trading meme coins a little bit because I've, I've understood basically if you if you just alienate meme coins, you're alienating so much of a market that is, you know, based on rotations, based on momentum. Mm. Um, so I have traded in and out of the of the meme coins. I wouldn't say I'm good at it. I would say that it is probably one of the easier and more exciting verticals to play, but I don't know when it turns but when it turns it will be very ugly mm. so just have that in mind I, I think there are a lot of people now considering to put like 20-30% of their portfolio in meme coins and just never sell it mm. uh, similar to how they're thinking about ETH or so sure maybe in the next 6 months it's going to work out and you make a ton of money I have no idea but at some point you're going to have to press the red button and I, I just know that for something like the meme coins, you're going to have those 90, 95% drawdowns. And it depends on how good you are at pressing the red button. If you're not good at it, you know, that's how you become exit liquidity. Last one on meme coins. Do you think it's, uh, because I was basically asking me for, do you think meme coins are the best beta play for each chain this cycle? There's these different narratives, right? And for example, if you look at last cycle, NFT was not that long, a couple of months. Yes. Even DeFi was a couple of months. And then it's next. And then people are thinking, oh, this narrative is going to come back. But it doesn't, right? Or it doesn't necessarily. I mean, maybe the DeFi one did, but yes. a lot of them don't. But it seems, at least it feels like, based on how much meme coin kind of pumped and where we're at in the cycle, basically Bitcoin halving, right? It seems that like, and the enthusiasm from retail people and how it caters to like, you know, lottery, yeah. but more fun. Yeah. That is something that could last. Obviously, you have big drawdowns in between, but that could last an entire cycle at least. Yeah. Especially it's not the first time. We had last cycle already yes. some examples, Correct. right? Yes. So it's maybe something to look at. So I don't want to make the call that memes are going to be the best e uh, beta place. I think it's going to really depend on what other alternative mm. narratives are out there. I think if you have interesting narratives that are out there, uh, it could supersede the memes. Uh, for example, uh, the Bitcoin halving, for example, could introduce an, a narrative by itself which could sap attention away. Right? Because if you, if you break it down, it's just a basic... Memes are... The, the power of the meme is basically how powerful it is in being able to obtain attention and retain it, right? How much holding power do you have, mm. right? So with, I think, is so interesting because the hat stays on is a ridiculously addictive line to say after a while. And so people very easily come back to it. And that's why WIF has been the outperforming meme coin for this cycle so far. Uh, but if you have other things that are really interesting, for example, AI, mm. uh, if you have an AI move, I guarantee you memes, the momentum and the capital longing memes are going to pull back to long AI coins, mm. right? So it's maybe over the cycle, you can argue that Pepe is the best meme sort of beta for ETH. I don't know. I don't think it will be that far off. All I know is that when it ends, yeah, it's going to fall off a cliff. So, but then again, you can make the same case for almost any beta coin for, for ETH or for so. Mm. So it's, yeah. So I said, my approach was I tried to look for a beta, for example, for ETH, Lido. Yeah. yeah. At some point, you say enough is enough, right? 
at some point. Right. Yes. And so there is something in, I mean, first, like for you, how quickly and what are the kind of factors that help you say enough is enough? Essentially, when do you cut would be a loss or just a lagger, right? Because there is an opportunity cost of having your money in a certain coin rather yep. than another. So I, this depends. Are you talking about a position or are you talking about the portfolio in general? Uh, position. Position. For me, the portfolio, we're going to talk about that later okay. when you start to de-risk and all that okay. stuff. So position-wise, um, I think you have to be, it depends on why you buy a token in the first place. Uh, if you buy it for a particular thesis, let's say a catalyst is going to happen. Or let's say you think that uh, this vertical is going to take off in a very meaningful way. Um, you cut the position when that thesis has been invalidated. Mm. So you see signs that indicate that what you think is going to happen is not going to happen any longer. Um, I think that is a prudent way to do it. The alternative is to have discretionary price points or like percentage drawn on limits where you say mm. below this Below like a 20% loss, I'm just going to cut the position. I don't care what else happens. And this is where tr sort of investing becomes more of an art because you, oftentimes you have to combine the two and it depends on the situation. Sometimes the fundamental invalidation would take precedence and sometimes the price-based invalidation would take precedence. So for example, um, maybe something like for a very volatile asset with no fundamental backing towards it. Meme coins, for example. You can make a trade with the invalidation that if it drops more than 25%, I de-risk, I cut, right? Because what else do I have to hold? Uh, there's nothing else that I can rely on to hold a position, right? Um, so that's one example. Obviously, it doesn't work all the time because many times, you know, meme coins have the 25% fluctuations and then you end up cutting the bottom and then it rebounds and you feel like an idiot. Uh, but that's why it's a, a, a difference between price-based price, price invalidation and thesis-based invalidation. And this is why I feel that I'm not very good at trading meme coins because uh, when you don't have a thesis based invalidation for for memes because there's no thesis i mean right there's nothing that you're waiting for so it's only price that you have to go off and when it's only price and it drops 20 percent, so you cut the position and how many times has has that worked out right it worked like it would just you just end up setting the bottom <laughs> like for the entire cycle until that one time where it's correct <laughs> Right, so it's 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 very challenging. This is why I think memes are very very difficult to trade. We're two weeks away from the Bitcoin halving. Yeah, but we already broke previous all time high, right? Yeah. So if you that was that was one of the key things that people are you were all looking at previous cycles. Oh yeah, okay. Previous uh, Bitcoin halving plus six months equal previous all time high ish. Hmm. But it happened much earlier this time. Yes. Where do you think we are in this cycle and why? So this one is very complicated because I there is no his, heuristic or historical sort of path to reference, right? This is net new territory that we're in. I don't think we're close to a cycle top yet. I think minimally Bitcoin will breach 100,000 before we can really call it cycle top. Above that, I have no idea. Does it top at 100? Does it top at 200? Does it top at 300? Who knows? Uh, I don't try to take profits based on certain price levels of Bitcoin. I just play until I feel that the music has stopped, wherever it may be. So... What does help you feel that the music has stopped? So, because my, of course, my question was not, hey, where do you think we're in this cycle? Yeah. My question is, what are the factors yeah. that you're looking at? Could be Bitcoin halving is now. Yes. Could be how long we are in the cycle since maybe the bottom last time or since the Bitcoin halving 
that is now. I actually don't play could that. Be, that much could be that. price levels. Yeah. Could be election year. Hmm. Could be interest rate cuts. Could be, you know, a more macro kind of play yes. where you say, yes. and then that's why maybe you go into, it's my idea, but like, it's a lot of people think like that, right? It's, uh, look, meme coins now, obviously, you need to look at which one, but like the entire, the entire thing is macro, macro plus Bitcoin halving, plus where we're at in some sort of, sort of Bitcoin price seems like it's still going to last quite a while. Okay, yeah, there's gonna, probably going to be some big drawdowns, but just because of the macro, right? It seems that it feels like, but you never know, obviously. And therefore, you can take more risks, you right? Can, and, then, yes. and then my other thesis that was, I'm thinking like that now, but my initial thesis was most of the gains will be made between bear market and Bitcoin previous all-time high. The ones without too much risk, because for me, once we breach previous all-time high, you can have great gains, but it becomes very risky because the, when the fourth start. Mm. But the other day I was talking with uh, Kaspar, uh, Kasper from uh, Spartan, right? And he was here. He was saying, my friends, they call me and they ask if they should sell Bitcoin because we were, we're just at previous all time. But for me, we're just starting the bull run. I think we're going into 2025 yeah. easily, yes. well into 20. So then I'm like, you know, that's yeah. why I'm asking. What's the framework? Obviously, no one has a crystal ball, but so the idea is understanding we, how you think. We look at a couple of things. Um, I think everything that you've pointed out plays a part in some way or not, uh, in, in some way or another. Um, I think for us, you have two very different flows entering the crypto space today. The first one is the retail flow. Right, and this is reflected via your Coinbase App Store rankings. Right, generally, how high is that on the App Store ranking means how much mind share and attention is being spilled over to mainstream retail. The second one is you have institutional flow, and this one is the real game changer that we had we didn't have the last cycle. This one can potentially lengthen the cycle a lot longer than what we're used to, or it can increase the velocity of money a lot faster than we're used to. Mm. Meaning when, you know, one example is when Bitcoin went from 30K basically to 70K without really stopping, right? I think nobody really expected that. Um, I look at, I think as long as institutional flows continue to be benign, you really just have to prefer to stay long because this is really a tidal wave of capital coming in to buy your banks. I think from a very high time frame perspective, crypto has so many tailwinds that allow prices to keep going up that it's very difficult to stay bearish for long. Mm. Even when you call cycle tops, you're calling a cycle top not because you think that's the top for crypto forever, but because you want to buy back lower at some point in the future, right? You're not, you're not saying, okay, I've, I've, I've earned all that I can from crypto. I'm selling everything and I'm never coming back, right? You always have this impression of, I've made enough for this cycle. I know there's going to be a crash coming and then I can be smart and buy it back, right? So I think with this ETF, it's going to throw a lot of people off guard because, well, the, fir the, the first thing is, Nobody really knows when these spurts of flows come, right? I think now we're seeing a bit of a lull in the flows. Three weeks ago, everybody was like, you know, the ETF is going to kickstart the super cycle. So, but at, I think the, the, the longer term direction is very clear, right? BlackRock is a huge supporter of crypto as an asset class. And with them pushing it, the rest of TradFi has to follow. And... I'm seeing a lot of people this cycle that are entertaining putting two to three percent in their of their portfolios in crypto versus last cycle mm. because of this ETF. So I wouldn't be surprised if we go to two, three hundred K this cycle. But again, I don't anchor to these price targets. For me, what I really look at is, you know, very similar to what I told you about Solana, right? 
when it broke, when it did something I didn't expect it to do. Mm. On the up, on the upswing, I also watch for these signals on the downswing. So, a classic case is if Bitcoin makes a lower high mm. and then starts selling off. That is something that would give me start having alarm bells in my head ringing, right? Because for, okay, very very great example. Right now, Bitcoin's at 70K. We just had a correction from 72 to call it 61 a couple of weeks ago, right? If you look back at it, normal bull market blip, 20% correction. We continue resuming up only. What happens if at 70K now, we go to 50K? That is not normal anymore, mm. right? We had a reset, leverage got wiped out. We retested an all-time high and then failed to break and then come back down forming a lower low. That to me means that whatever my biases of being long I had, I have to start reevaluating them. So that would be a signal to me that it's maybe time to take some chips off the table simply because I don't, my vision of what I think the future will be is a lot blur, more blurry. And so as you, you are never going to be able to sell the top, right? Uh, but I think if you adopt that kind of probabilistic approach, you'll be able to save yourself a lot of pain, right? So let's say, for example, if let's say 70K was the top, which is unthinkable to most people now, uh, even to me, right? If you have a hard rule and say, if Bitcoin drops below 55K, I sell everything, I go to cash. Forget about it. That means to you now, your defined maximum loss is like 25%. Mm. That means in this cycle, at most you can lose is 25%. Right? And that's how you protect yourself if it is really the top. The question then is having these plans in place, but also having plans in place if they're wrong. So if let's say you have a fake out. Bitcoin goes to 70, goes to 50K. So it breaks your invalidation. So you cut everything you sell. And then it cut, 50K bounces back to 70K. Right? Then you're like, oh, I'm sidelined again. Right? So these are the questions that we always ask ourselves. But if Bitcoin were to make those kind of moves, going, to, going from 30 to 70 to 60 to 70 to 50 to 70, what does it mean? Basically, it means that you're in a very long extended range of chop. Yeah. And in chop, the easy money is not meant to be made, right? You only want to play the game when the easy money is made. So it's very simple, right? Then what you, what you do is actually you wait for a proper break of 70K. So that you say, mm. you say, okay, I only start longing when Bitcoin hits 80K because then you know that long-term resistance has now been broken and it's very clear we're in a bull market again. Then you play the game because it's easy, right? So I think that's how I approach it. Um, so I don't care. The, the numbers I gave you, you can change it around. Yeah. It can be 100K yeah. to 80K. It can be anything you want. But that's the probabilistic way of how I try to mitigate losses. Because if you do that, you have a better chance at keeping 70%, maybe 60% of your portfolio. I fully, I, I don't believe for a fact that you like you draw down 10% from all-time high. I think it's absolutely bonkers because of crypto's volatility. Mm -hmm. I think if you can navigate a cycle and draw down like 30% from all-time high to, to, to cycle low, you would have done fantastically well, mm. right? So I think if you take steps like that, your chances of drawing down only 30% increase dramatically. And maybe even you draw down 50%, but that's still fine, right? Because you've made enough for your wealth to have compounded. How do you stick to your rules? Because it's tough. A lot of people, I mean, probably everyone, uh, uh, maybe until you go direct, right? Yeah. Like then you learn, uh, maybe next time I should follow my rules, but you have your rules that you set initially and then you become greedy or... <laughs> that is the part about having the discipline, having a right system in place so that you don't break your rules. I break my rules more often than I like. I think everyone does. And every time I break my rules, I lose money. Exactly. Almost every That's time. It. And so it's very clear to me because so I, 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 do a, I do a trading reflection once in a while and especially when there's a big move, either a right, a right call or a wrong call. And then I look at it and I say, okay, what did I do right or what did I do wrong? 
And every time when it's a huge loss, I would have fucked up at least two or three big rules that I had. <laughs> and I was like, ah, okay. <laughs> I realized this was what well, I had set these rules in place, but I was an idiot and I didn't listen to them. And this is why I deserve to lose money. Done. Yeah. Do you think we get another blow off top? I mean, there was no blow off top last cycle, but there was a big drawdown. Do you think this time it's different or do you think that we get, even on Bitcoin or ETH, another, you know, 70, 80% correction again from the top, despite the ETFs? And for me, yeah. I, for me, I was just trying to think, how do I think about that? I was looking at people calling kind of 10 trillion top this cycle. Mm. Could be less, yeah. could be more, I don't mm. know. Let's say it's probably going to be less, but anyway, who knows? Then I was looking at uh, Nasdaq bubble 2001. There was ETFs there. And I think the Nasdaq topped at kind of like 10 trillion market cap and it still went down mm. a lot. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of my, because obviously you want to be, you, you want to be optimistic yes. and think oh, ETF change everything, right? But you want to find examples that are very similar or similar in the past that prove you completely wrong. And so for me, I was looking at that. Yeah. Oh, the numbers might be wrong, right? But like, kind of like, it's probably not going to be that different, right? Despite so, ETFs and all that stuff. I think people forget to realize what the ETFs actually mean. The ETFs mean that the general investing world can now invest in crypto. But they are not so different from you and I. The guy managing a family office somewhere or the people managing sovereign wealth funds or even the companies that are potentially buying Bitcoin, they're still humans. They still follow herd mentality. So you're going to get the same type of human irrationality that we had in the past cycles, uh, just with a lot more dollars at stake. I don't think the pattern is going to change. I, don't th I think you're still going to get 70% drawdowns on BDC. But the numbers are just far, far higher. And for what it's worth, I still think at some point, BTC will hit a million dollars. Mm. At some point. It can be 10 years down, it can be 20 years down, it can be 30 years, whatever. But I think the long-term trajectory of Bitcoin, uh, I think is more or less secured with this, uh, with this ETF. A lot of people start their crypto journey from their basement, yeah. as we like to meme it, yeah. or from their room. It's very lonely. It is. And you're also very prone to make a lot of mistakes because you're doing your thing alone, right? Yes. You told me that working together as a team is so much better than yes. working alone. Yes. Obviously in life in general, I think the same, but in crypto even more. Right? Yes, 100%. Why? There's so many things happening in crypto today. As one person, you cannot cover it all. So, um, and this is what we've been really cognizant of uh, in Tangent, where we try and bring on people that we know can fill specific skill sets that everyone else lacks. So we have all bases covered, basically. But even taking away from, an, from a sort of company building standpoint, uh, having a group of friends that can watch things when you are unable to watch them, maybe can pick up, they're in, they're in some group chats that share alpha that maybe you're not in. And so you can get this via your friends. Uh, I think it's so important, mm. right? And also having people to bounce ideas off, sharp people to bounce ideas off where you can second, you can recheck your biases that you have with other people who can offer an alternative viewpoint. I think that's extremely important because very often what causes huge mistakes is when people are in a not the right mental framework and they're on, so basically they're on tilt and then they have no, no one holding them back from making worse and worse compounding decisions that eventually result in them losing it all. Mm. I think very rarely do you have a situation in which you lose like you, you do extremely well and then you make one mistake and you lose everything. 
it's, it's very rare. You have to have situations like FTX happen or Luna happen for that to really happen. Mm -hmm. But in general setting, apart from systemic issues like that, it doesn't happen. What happens is you do very well and then you start getting a bad run. and you just, you'll, So you start eating a couple of small losses. You get frustrated. You size up because you want to make back the losses but you're not in the right framework and then you just keep compounding it and then you lose everything. What they call revenge training, right? Exactly. Yeah. So having people around you would maybe try and at least mitigate some of that when maybe your friends can say, hey, I think you're in a not, not right frame of mind. Why don't we step back? We go for a beer. We take things chill and then we reset. You said you think BTC goes down 70-80%, right? Yeah which is the result of, you know, a bubble is a leveraging event and then you have a deleveraging event, basically. Correct. Yes. When deleveraging happens, people and companies blow up. Yes, as we've seen. Exactly, as we've seen. Do you think the same kind of thing can happen again at that scale? And I, I remember I was... a. Uh, I think it was 2022 or late 2021, I was uh, watching on Netflix the Quadriga Exchange. Mm. I don't know if you're familiar with that. That was 2018. Vaguely, or vaguely, It's yes. an exchange in Canada where the guy kind of like, I don't know, went to India and then died because of like some stomach problem, but it's not probably not true. He just took the money and right. ran away. And I was kind of laughing. I was like, man, these are the old days of crypto. This could never happen again. And the next thing you know, a couple of days later, a couple of months later, FTX. you have Luna, yeah. you have Celsius, you have BlockFi, you have Voyager, and then you have FTX. Yes. So it's basically much worse than what yes. happened yes. years later. So I think it's it's going to still happen. Um, I think the regulatory frameworks in place now are nowhere near mm. what we have in traditional finance. And even in traditional finance, you're still seeing these things happen, right? It's in human nature, the greed that we all have will result in these negative externalities happening. Um, the main difference is last cycle, your big blow ups are like companies losing $10 billion. Even Luna was like a $50 billion loss. The fear is the next cycle. It's not a $10 billion <laughs> loss. It is a fifth, it's like a hundred, maybe $200 billion loss. Mm. And at that scale, even if TradFi wanted to step in and save it, they may not. Like you, you may actually need like the Fed to actually come in and save you. Similar to like you know what happened with the 08 crisis and the Fed stepped in with QE. That's the kind of scale that we're talking at talking about if regulatory frameworks are not put in place. Mm. Uh, but oh, I believe probably that gonna happen again, it's right? probably going to happen again. Where do you think it happens? That's a good question. Because you're thinking, where does the leverage come this cycle? Last cycle was lending and borrowing yes. from CFI, right? Yes, that's more or less died off. This cycle, we have liquid staking derivative, restaking, all that stuff, right? Mm. <laughs> I, haven't put, like I haven't put too much thought into it. I don't think we're anywhere near the levels where I would get concerned yet. Mm. Um, it could be an attack vector. Uh, but to be honest, I haven't given it it's that. It's probably going to put it from a place that we don't know. Yes. It's the same as what's the next big thing this cycle? Last cycle was uh, DeFi summer. Yes. It came out of nowhere. Yes. This time was meme coin out of nowhere. Yes. People were anticipating gaming, AI, social, fi, all that stuff. Yes. Yes, cool, but no, it came from meme coin. Yes. Probably the blow up comes from something that we're like, Poof. No idea. Yeah. Never I, expected I don't, that. I don't pretend to, to know, <laughs> you know. Um, that's why these things are so deadly because they, they, they catch you by surprise. Um, but the but takeaway is probably... It, it will happen. It's going to happen I, I'm quite like sure. mega deleveraging event. Yes. Blow, I mean, mega drawdown in BTC ETH. 95, 97, 99% in alts as usual. As usual. And, and some big companies blowing up. And yes. some people losing a lot of money. So a, a funny thing uh, was, and this is a, a, a pretty hilarious story now that I tell people. Uh, when Bitcoin was 20K uh, in 2022, my then girlfriend, now wife, asked me, hey, Bitcoin seems to have dropped quite a bit. Shall, is it a good time to buy the dip at 20K? And I was like, sure, 
why not? Uh, you can, I, I don't think it's that bad a decision to buy Bitcoin at 20K now. And so she did. And she asked me, where shall I custody this? And at the time I was like, well, you can custody with FTX. Because if FTX goes down, crypto is dead anyway. <laughs> and so she actually did. And so when, when FTX did indeed go, went, go under, she lost her Bitcoins. Yeah. So that is, uh, I still get flack to it for, for it today. Um, but yes, I have, I have recompensated her or I will recompensate her on her Bitcoin. But you know, that, that's a funny story that basically even things that I think are safe. Yeah. They turn out they're not. not yeah, probably you want to think same as you want to go against your intuition in markets in general. Uh, if I feel like things are too good, probably it's a good time to chill or whatever I think is safe. It's probably not safe. Never, or, never take anything for granted, mm, basically. That's very hard. That's very, very hard. Yeah. So you joined forces with some friends of yours. Yep. A part of the team, a team called Tangent. Yep. What is Tangent and why did you start the collective? So we initially started off as an angel investing collective. Uh, it was really just myself and Jason, Jason Choi, uh, who I've been good friends with ever since 2020. Um, we decided to try and, uh, at, at the time we felt that there was a market gap, uh, in the angel investing space, because I think angels were just putting on very small checks and then not doing anything after that, uh, just as sort of like a KOL sort mm -hmm. of publicity round. Uh, so we felt that we could try and push the standard there. I think we did that reasonably successfully, um, for the better part of 2023. Uh, I think if you can ask most of our pod hosts today, uh, most would have pretty good reviews about us as uh, supporting investors. Um, I think we did that for about a year. And then Jason and I decided, you know, we had been comfortable enough working with each other that we it's time to combine net worths. And because I actually had a liquid trading experience, that's really where my bread and butter was. Uh, I would actually start to expand and retrade what I'm good at. So we started doing a bit of liquid trading uh, at the start of 2023. And since then, we've grown to a team of seven. Mm. Now, everyone works on, uh, well, more than half the team works on liquid investing at Tangent, and it's entirely prop capital. So it's uh, just Jason and my, uh, my net worth inside. We still have... 99% of our net worth in, in crypto. We're still max long. We're still bullish the space. But uh, we're gunning for it. I think our goal is to become uh, one of the powerhouses of uh, crypto funds in Asia. Mm. So something you did really well. I mean, you kind of like did that the accelerated route, right? But yeah. something that is very important for new people in crypto to understand is the first cycle should be about building the right connections. Yes, absolutely. So that the second cycle, you'll be able to capitalize fully because you have the right connections, the absolutely. right accesses, yeah. the right kind of framework, chances are the right people. Chances are in your first cycle, you really spend most of that learning the right lessons or blowing up along the way. So e either one. Um, so you, you find a group of friends over the first cycle. Uh, you find a good system or good process. You discover who you are as an investor. Mm. Maybe you prefer to be a longer term investor. Maybe you prefer to trade shit coins on an hourly basis. Mm -hmm. Maybe you actually prefer venture investing because you are too jaded or disillusioned with what's happening in the crypto liquid markets, that's fine, mm. right? Um, so you discover yourself and then in the second cycle, you really understand what your age is, where the market opportunity is, who you can leverage to help you get there. And then you really make your money. What should someone do to join the best teams for the next cycle? And if I look like more specifically, what's the type of value? Because there is always value that can be brought, right? When you arrive in crypto, you might think it's very intimidating. You might think, oh man, these guys are so smart. They're so advanced compared to me. I can't bring them anything. 
but it's probably you know a type of value that you guys let's say a tangent or yeah. spartan or that kind of places right are still looking for and you would onboard as employee or partner or you know in mm-hmm. whatever like i think first and foremost we want to find someone with the right ethical and cultural fit uh so at tangent we try to uphold the highest ethical standards um so that by itself you know as i said earlier in the pod uh, we've seen a lot of stuff that uh we're not too pleased with this happening in the industry but there's nothing we can do about it uh so that's the first screen right if if you don't meet that bar you know there's no point um the second thing is i want to see hunger i want to see people really hungry and looking to make it really leaving no stone unturned uh being very malleable in their mind being able to learn anything that you ask them to go and learn uh because i think these people are the ones that develop and hone the killer instinct the quickest so i don't really care about whether you're a university graduate or not mm. um i want to see how you pitch i want to see the quality of your ideas how many ways have you looked at certain things what are the angles uh what are the risks how probabilistic is your thinking um we usually when we talk to people we have like two or three different rounds of interviews to sort of suss it out um and i'm i'm a firm believer that if you are really the cream of the crop we will pay you commensurately because i think that's a big issue as well amongst uh, a lot of funds mm. uh globally so um it's ethics it is how hungry you are and it's how sharp you are those are the three things so i think ethics you kind of have to make that decision by yourself um but hunger you can't really take teach sharpness actually i think can be taught i think i've seen or i have seen last cycle and i'm seeing this cycle a lot of people that i didn't think mm. were that sharp but were very eager to learn and over time they got a lot better so i think it can be it can be learned yeah there is a part in this podcast where we talk about the guest favorite projects in the space yeah I had a lot of people who are part of the Pudgy community on this podcast. Oh yes. I'm one too. Me too. Uh and I know you're one too. Yeah. You bought a bunch of a bunch of Pudgy penguins. Why? I felt that the culture was the most honest. Mm. I think the vibes are the best. And I was a very early Pudgy appreciator actually. Um when they came out uh i was buying a number of pudgies below 1 eth actually and over time i sold most of them except my signature one and then recently i decided to buy a couple again uh mostly because i think over a long enough time frame they're going to do okay as a level eth bet mm. uh and this is really one of those actual level eth situations because it's denominated in eth um i just like the vibes man i think that's basically it like i don't like why do you like art because you like how it looks or you like the vibes or you like how it fits in your room you know like that's why you buy it for nf for nfts it's quite the same to me you are more of a trailer right i am therefore you probably have like so let's not say a target but something that you think is possible this cycle for pudgies for pudgies yeah i think 50 eth not out of the question i think right now you've seen sort of a artificial cap for nfts uh that probably basically hit last cycle where i think a floor basey was equivalent to one of your very high end luxury watches about mm. if i'm not wrong it was like 3 to 500k something along that yeah. range at the top of basey's i think it was like 150 eth when eth was like 3k 150 yeah Right. So something like that that's probably the top. So you're looking at not that's very interesting. You're not not looking at hey if punks or board apes went to let's say 100 ETH. Yeah. Therefore Pudgy could go there. You're not looking at ETH denomination. I'm looking at dollars. For, you're looking yeah. at dollars. Yes. Very interesting. Because mm. um if you think about luxury collectible items 
I think people will still anchor to luxury goods. So for example, if a pachi penguin costs more than a Ferrari, then that distinction to the person that can afford both of them starts to be, do I want a floor pachi or do I want a Ferrari? And then all of a sudden, the vibes from the Ferrari may be better than the pachi. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so it's it's... That's where I th- that, that's why I think Pachi sort of caps at a certain price. Maybe I'm wrong. It and is a mid curve uh, take on maybe it, the, the 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 dumb like the left curve yeah. take is just ah oh, the other one went to that many E's, therefore yeah. this one it goes to that be, many E's, be. right? And I I actually think something <laughs> that goes against my my view is the fact that I think over time digital IP will get valued more and more versus physical items. Mm. So that could be it. I also think for that to happen, let's say for let's say for example, ETH goes to 10k, right? And Pachis goes to 100 ETH, which means that each part each party is a million dollars, right? I have three people on this podcast. Alex Van Evik, James Wu, and Luke Belmar all yeah. saying Pudge is going to 100 ETH. Yeah. So So in that situation, even Casper actually from your from a Spartan said the yes. same, and he's a pudgy also. <laughs> I know. I wish. It, I, I I hoping that it happens as well. But for that to happen, right? For Pudgies to re- to reach a million dollars, you're gonna need a lot of wealth to be created for yeah. people to have that kind of spending power. Yeah. Right. For me to be like, because I'm not talking about like a golden pudgy. I'm talking about a base pudgy. Yeah. Right. For It's a it's a pretty big decision, right? If how rich do you have to be to be like, all right, I'm gonna buy a pudgy today and drop a million dollars on a pudgy. <laughs> I agree. But right, you can buy yeah. like a house on a lake somewhere, <laughs> or you can yeah, buy but like in an irrational moment of crypto. You know, <laughs> everything is going to. Yeah, no, I agree. So, agree. so it, it's it's <laughs> like crypt- maybe you're too rational. <laughs> like crypto wheels have to be so rich yeah. to get to that point. And well, I certainly hope that we get there. To me, right now, it seems a bit, a, a bit far fetched. Mm. Yeah. What are another two or three projects or team that you really like in the space? I think the Ronin team right now is really good. Um, I had a close friend who was actually uh, one of the people I hired in Defiance. Uh, he actually left to go and join the Sky Mavis team. Mm. Uh, his name is Bailey. Shout out to him. Um, he's been great. He's been helping uh, the Sky Mavis team build out the Ronin ecosystem over the last two years. And I think uh, Ronin today is the third most used blockchain in the world, I think behind Tron and either ETH or Sol. Um, and I think them as an ecosystem bet on game, Web3 gaming is one of the clearest bets that I still have today uh, because... I think we still haven't really cracked the code for what Web3 Gaming can be, meaning a completely separate economic system of virtual assets being traded and virtual business models being created based on a particular type of uh, game that has been designed. Mm. So we are still scratching the surface of what Web3 Gaming is. And when... You don't really know what can be the future. You typically, or you're not really willing to risk betting on what you think will be the future. You typically bet on proxies. An ecosystem. And Ronin, I think so far, has proven to me to be the best ecosystem out there today, by far. So it's not, and this is, I mean, take it, if you want to take it as a Ronin shill, sure. Um, disclosure, we have a Ronin position as well. Uh, but I think it's um, it's a very comfortable uh, bet for us. And we don't think it's going away because I think the three things so far that have been consistent movers, at least this cycle, AI, gaming, and meme coins. Right. So Ronin for us is a very easy proxy bet in gaming. Mm. And you know, over time maybe we find um, certain things that we think can outperform within the gaming ecosystem. But, uh, and actually we talk about this in tangent, but it's called the aircraft carrier thesis, whereby uh, Ronin is the aircraft carrier. So it continues to sail. And every time you see a game that you think, oh wow, this is really interesting. This could push Web3 Gaming in a certain way. 
you make a small bet. So you sell Ronin into that gaming bet. And then if you're right, mm. after that thesis is realized, you sell that game back into back Ronin. Into Ronin. Yeah. And then the Ronin bag just keeps getting bigger. So that is how we're viewing Web3 Gaming today. So at some times, depends on when you catch me, um, I may have no Ronin or a lot of Ronin. Mm. Uh, but that really depends on like, do I think another game is going to be massively bullish? Right. So for example, I could be trading between Pixels and Ronin because mm. maybe I think Pixels is levered Ronin in that sense. Mm. And then when the thesis is done, I sell my Pixels into Ronin. Mm. Uh, but I think Ronin is a very clear denomination bet for gaming itself. What else? What else? The key narratives. In or maybe not. Could be something that goes against, you know, so the I crowd. I think something that uh, has caught some people, um, ha some people have started taking notice is Prime, mm. uh, the, the TCG, uh, specifically because of the colony game that they're building up. I think they recently released a white paper about uh, what they intend on open sourcing uh, in terms of their gaming models there. And I think if you watch the demo for Colony, it is one of the coolest shit I have seen in a long time. And so this and this perfectly fits within the AI and gaming yep. uh, sort of verticals. So it's, you know, best of both worlds. Yep. Uh, it's because of that, I don't think it has a valuation ceiling. I think as a trading card game, which is what Prime was for the better part of 2021, two and three, um, you could make arguments that says that, okay, you know, at a billion dollars is sort of overvalued. Uh, but once you introduce this sort of AI 1.5 gamer type of situation, and just for your audience, uh, Colony is a game where you're basically God, the player is God, you give instructions to an AI that help that does things on your behalf. So it's it's not like you are the person controlling the AI and going to do things. Mm -hmm. You give them instructions and they do things naturally. It's almost, I wouldn't call it sentient, but like it's sort of in the middle. And I've never seen that ever in like in any Web2 game as well. So I think that is very interesting. I think if people catch on and let's say this AI gaming um, narrative takes off, there's no ceiling for this. How do you value something like this? Um, so Prime is something that we're really interested in as well. So your main bet is, and I read something the other day online, it was exactly that. It's the, you, you want to bet on the narratives that don't have a ceiling, right? Yes. That is basically, it's important it, because there's no real fundamentals. Yes. You can't really, basically people can dream, Correct. right? Yes. And so it would be, uh, from what I read was meme coin, AI mm. yeah. and gaming yeah. or AI gaming, right? Yes. All the rest, one way or another, there is some sort of ceiling just because there is comparables or fundamentals or it's kind of less. Yes and no. It's um, less, basically is what they call bubble assets, right? Correct. Like, correct. Yes. Um, so I, I think actually one other area that I've missed out most is RWA, because mm. my mid curve take was RWA is too closely tied to cash flows, because when you value an RWA asset, you basically value the yield, yeah. and for people using the yield, they typically would actually look at the numbers and value things. Um, and then you have Ondo breaking $10 billion today. So uh, that one is a bit of a head scratcher to me. Uh, you know, truly the one Ondo is one condo meme is really, I think, the crux of the thesis there. Uh, and also the one fact that they've Ondo become... One condo. <laughs> yeah, it's also the fact that they've become the, the default BlackRock uh, proxy. So I think that's what's really driving the performance. But as you, as you can see, Ondo is an RWA coin, right? Um, that without the Blackwell Association would probably be, be worth maybe a tenth of what is currently valued. But with the Blackwell Association, now suddenly you have a narrative, right? And that narrative allows you to dream far bigger than what the fundamentals suggest. So that's why Ondo has been moving. I don't know how big it is, but the ceiling for Blackrock is pretty large as well. Mm. <laughs> 
So, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if it keeps going, although I, I do not I do not hold any on though right now. I did trade it, but not not now. What's your advice to the crypto industry newcomers who want to change their life and future? Oh I think you have to be very mentally prepared for insane levels of volatility. I think for people who have never experienced it before, you are going to go through a very, very stressful time. It could be euphoria, meaning good stress, or it could be you know, massive drawdowns, which is really bad stress. So I think you have to mentally prepare yourself for that kind of journey in crypto. Um, it's unlike anything else that you see in the world today uh, or your experience in any other career or profession. I think the closest thing is probably like a commodities or FX trader that uses a lot of leverage. Uh, but you know, how many people are that? So I think don't, again, don't anchor to specific financial goals. Like I think it's very, very dangerous if you go into crypto saying, this is the place to get rich. I'm going to make $2 million by the end of the year. And then I'm going to sell, I'm going to buy, sell everything and buy my house. I think that is one of the worst ways you can approach it. Because once you start fixating on certain price targets, then if you, if let's say, you know, it's like October and you have three months left and you're nowhere near your goal, you become more and more desperate to start betting on things. And that's usually the worst time to be taking all these kind of bets because it's the late, later and later in the cycle and that's how you lose everything. So, yeah, I think don't play, dance while the music plays, but don't be fixated on any one number and when the music stops and it's time to back up, you just let it go. Whatever, whatever stage you may be at. I think that's important. What's your biggest prediction for next 12 months? That's a good one. I think we have, I think this, I think we go through one very heavy cycle in 12 months. So we probably break through to like maybe 100K in like maybe the next two to three months. And then we have a very brutal correction where people think 100K is the top and then you get a sell down to maybe like 60, 70K again. And that will catch a lot of people off guard, similar to how in the last cycle, Bitcoin went to 64 and then, and then went back to 30 and then 69 again. And I think these these are the moves that kill you the most because by every TA level, you're, you're supposed to be out. And then like the market was supposed to have topped at 64, right? What kind of drawdown is from 64 to 30K? It's like more than 50% drawdown. There's, there's no system that allows you that kind of drawdown, right? So you would have been invalidated. You would think market cycles over and then it comes back. So I think you're going to get stuff like something similar to that as well. And it's going to catch a lot of people off guard. Uh, and the reason why it's the case is because if trading market cycles were as easy as, oh, when Bitcoin hits 100K, it's the top I sell, then everybody would be rich. Mm -hmm. But these cycles are extremely tre treacherous to navigate. And that is why... I say that if you can actually walk away from everything at the end of the day and only be down like 30% from yeah. your highs, that's a, that's a pattern back. That's a job well done to you. Amazing, man. Thank you so much for doing that. Yeah. It's a great conversation. Yeah. That's perfect.